Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today I'll be doing a poem called The Fish by Elizabeth Bishop. So, um, in the late 1930s, Bishop discovered Florida and a love of fishing, all right? So this is specifically very important for higher level students because you have to know about like the poet and you know the background and whatever. So based on real fishing experiences, her notebooks of the time show images and line fragments that were later on developed in this poem called The Fish. Um, she worked on the poem during the winter of 1939 and sent the finished draft to Marianne Moore in January 1940. It's irrelevant, but you know I'm just telling you what I have of notes. And the poem was first published in the Partisan Review in March that year. Now, the speaker, all right? The poem is narrated, very important, in the first person. So we get to meet the poet because the, the, as a first person, she's speaking as Elizabeth Bishop, all right? Uh, the I in the poem uh, directly is used in many of Bishop's uh, poems, in her poetry in general. And this gives us the experience described in the poem as immediacy, and an animediacy, and an intimacy for the reader. However, as the reader may feel closely involved in the drama, there is a hint that the speaker herself is somehow as an outsider to all this what's happening in the poem, alright? Um, She's not a native of the place. Uh, she's just the inhabitant of a rented boat. So she rents a boat, goes on fishing. What happens next is interesting. So this lends a certain objectivity to the drama and the description of it. We're also introduced here to the famous Bishop I, which sees both the beautiful and the grimy, and which describes not only surface detail, but even imagery of the interior. And what I mean, you will see throughout the poem itself as I analyze it. So, it, like, when you read a poem, and I quote, uh, the lines, the dramatic reds and blacks of his shiny entrails, and the pink swim bladder, like a big pony. Now, minute descriptions and calculated use of detail are a feature of Bishop's poetry. So if you ever get a question in higher level on how, like, the <coughs> techniques of Bishop's writing of poetry, this is what you can focus on if you choose to, right? So the calculated use of detail, the vivid imagery of objects, of, of fish, of whatever it is, any poem that you're analyzing. So this is how she apprehends the world and comes to grips with experience, through aesthetic recreation. Now, detail is important as it's a basis of understanding of her poetry, okay? So, Bishop recreates the fish in minute detail. So, so, so basically she says, at first she demo, demo, uh, domesticates it in the imagery, making it familiar by linking it to the details of faded everyday living. She says, he, so she's even giving it a characteristic for human being, he, pronoun, alright? So, he is homely. Brown skin hung in strips like ancient wallpaper, shapes like full-blown roses, rags of green weed. This makes me imagine and see the way the fish looks like. Old, raggy, you know, like this almost dying, experienced, ancient. These words are associated with the fish, in my opinion. There's a lot of vivid imagery. This is one of the most used poetic techniques with Bishop and in this poem specifically. Yet something of its essential wildness, the otherness of its creative being, is returned, is retained in some of the descriptions. As she says, the frightening gills, fresh and crisp with blood, that can cut so badly. There's like this rendered, like this is also rendered in war imagery, from his lower lip Grim, wet and weapon-like, hung five old pieces of fish line. See how strong the imagery is. Like medals with the ribbons, frayed and wavering. Awards given to soldiers, sergeants, army members, military, wherever it is. So, like, we are being uh, directed to focus <clears throat> towards the fish in a certain manner that the fish has been awarded survival emblems or maybe survival uh, medals, all right? So we get an insight that the fish has already been caught five times before because of the fact that hung five old pieces of fish line and survived. So the fish is warrior, like it's a warrior. It, 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 it is the undefeated creature, which, is, which now lies in the hands of Bishop because she caught it, right? So she caught the fish and now is she gonna let it go? Yes, at the end of the poem. 
But perhaps the most crucial moment in the poet's comprehension of the fish is when she examines the eyes of the fish and says they were far larger than mine, but shallower and yellowed. The rice is backed and packed with tarnished tinfoil, seen through the lenses of old scratched isinglass. The detail that she talks about the eyes of the fish and looking through the eyes of the fish, like I'm looking through the lens of the camera now, uh, is very much like, like imaginative. Like I could, I could see the eyes. Um, the detail is recreated poetically using the echoes and sound effects of alliteration and assonance. You can also rely on these. Um, reminiscent of a Hopkins escaping, recreating in words the essence of the thing observed, shallower, yellowed, backed and packed. You hear that? You hear that tarnished tinfoil, TNT, assonance, and alliteration as well. Now, the detailed recreation leads to the poet's realization that these eyes are unresponsive. The fish is oblivious to her. There's no real sentient contact between human and animal. So they shifted a little, but not to return my stare, as if she's actually used to this, or she's wary. She no longer, you know, has, she's like already dead, you know? So is it fed up or is it survival? Is it a technique of survival? Because it worked, because she was let go at the end. So there's no question here of humankind's heroic struggle against nature. This is something, I'm taking this poem to a, you know, to a next level. Uh, such as we find in Hemingway's The Old Man and the Sea. You don't have to know this, just, you know, adding on extra stuff. Um, we notice that even she is, uh, as she is asserting the absolute integrity of her eye and the accuracy of the descriptive process, she is also aware of the creative demands of the poetic process. The poem is an accurate record, record but only up to a point. It's a dramatic poem. So we get a sense that all this has happened, but there's drama, like based on, like you know those movies based on true story, based on true events, so this is a based on true events kind of poem, all right? The critique, uh, Willard Spiegelman, reflecting on the dramatic quality of Bishop's poetry said, this is important for hire, we do not normally think of Bishop as a poet of struggle. The tension in her poems is mostly internalized, and confrontations, when they occur, are between the self traveling, moving, or simply seeing, and the landscape it experiences. So, higher level, note this down. This is particularly applicable to this poem in detail. The first and last lines it says, I caught a tremendous fish, and the last line says, and I let the fish go. Frame this drama. It's like, why make all this big fuss if you're gonna let it go at the end? Why analyze it, stare it? Why go fish anyway if you're gonna let it go? You know what I'm saying? Feeling guilty, feeling bad. Something the poet has felt with this fish that resentment, I don't know. Um, there is little external conflict, though there are hints of military antagonism and danger from the fish. The confrontation framed by these lines is mainly internal. So why does she release the fish after all? Like, this is a question that you should be asking yourself for when it comes to the analysis of this poem. Was it because of the lack of heroic struggle? Like, he didn't fight, he hadn't fought at all. Is it because no fight was kept by the fish? So it's completely the opposite. It's ironic because the fish received emblems, you know, and like medals for it being, uh, like, survived with all these threads across, you know, from like from the fishing rods and all these threads across his lower lip. But it's not a fighter. So the fish gave up on life? Or what exactly? Is this why she releases it back in the water? Does the lack of contact in the eyes disappoint the poet? Or does she release him out of respect for his history of previous successful encounters? Like the way it has five uh, threads, five-haired beard of wisdom trailing from his aching jaw. This is how she calls it, right? Perhaps these are part of the decision, but the real moment of truth occurs because, the because of the sudden appearance of the accidental industrial rainbow when the bilge oil gleams in the sun. This is so important. And because it says, where oil has spread a rainbow around the rusted engine. Um, a grim parody of natural beauty, an ironic comment on humankind's relationship with nature, it provides the poet with a moment of aesthetic unity with the world. And everything is transformed. It says, everything was rainbow, rainbow, rainbow. Suddenly from all that gloominess, well, the fish had a bad day, obviously. Now everything is, you know, fun and fine. It is a moment of revelation in which this new image of the fish colors the environment and alters her relationship with nature. She's becoming more acceptable, the poet, towards nature and how it's like. She lets the fish go. 
No longer antagonistic or confrontational, she has metaphorically tamed, recreated, and understood the fish, henceforth letting it go. The ending of the poem, Higher Students, is very similar to a Wordsworth nature poem, such as one called The Daffodils. You probably didn't take this before. The hypnotic vision, and it says, I stared and stared, the wealth accruing to the viewer, victory filled up, the little rented boat, same thing, and feelings of inspiration and joy through creating a connection with the world, a world that has been transformed by the vision, this moment of epiphany, and it says, where oil had spread a rainbow around the rusted engine to the baler rusted orange until everything was rainbow, rainbow, rainbow. Basically, this is it. It is, I wouldn't... <coughs> For ordinary level, I wouldn't say it's a go-to poem, because it's pretty long, and it can go in any way possible. But for the analysis of Bishop as a higher level student, I would love to use this poem. Because it's not that difficult for a higher student, and it's it's it comprehends a lot of Bishop's works and shows them here, like the assonance, the multiple use of alliteration and assonance and, and the vivid imagery, which is her like one of her strongest uh, you know, features, the attention to detail. Anyway, guys, thank you very much for being here. If you have any questions, please drop them down below. See you next time.